Welcome to Princeton Tonight, everybody. I'm your host, Jordan Salama, and we have such an interesting guest on the show today. He's the mastermind behind the formidable look of the Joker in The Dark Knight, the famous SNL Coneheads, and many other iconic characters. Please welcome to the show Oscar and Emmy Award-winning makeup artist, John Caglione Jr. Hey, Jordan. Hey. Nice to be with you. Nice to be with you. Yeah. It's great. It's great thank to have you. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for this coming. Great. Uh, so, how's your day been? You've been in Princeton for. It, I love day. it. I love it. I, I, this has really been great. Great day. Fun. And have you been busy at work? Have you been working on other projects before coming here? Are, you, are we taking you away from? No, from I'm actually on a little break right now. You are okay. And we just finished a TV pilot, and so That's I'm you all do. yours. Yeah. yeah. So, is, have you I'm been putty working? in your hands? Right. <laughs> Well, we, we like Pardon to think of all of our guests. It's the makeup <laughs> thing. I yeah. Um, always refer to. So I don't know why. So are yeah. you mainly working on TV pilots, or are you working more on movies? Like, wh how has your work been divided? Yeah, lately, it's been a lot of TV. New York is being bombarded with t TV pilots. and uh, That's great. Yeah, so I got to work on a couple of good ones. There was uh, this one called The Deuce, which is James Franco, Maggie Gyllenhaal. I think it's going to be out on HBO. And uh, I just finished one called The Interestings, which is really, really great and interesting. But it was, <laughs> and I'm good. sorry, I'm not, I'm a makeup guy. I shouldn't be trying to be funny. But no, no, that's good. This was, that uh, was a good one. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. That was going to be my follow-up to, it, was oh. it an interesting show? So it was good. Like, we're, <laughs> oh, we're, good. We're working well, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, you, do you want to start over? We'll no, we, we're not going to. You can have that good. line? Okay. We'll just keep going. Yeah, um, so, so we just finished The Interestings, and it was really, really great. Are you allowed to tell us what it's about? I can't okay. tell you. Um, but it, I can tell you it was a blast, and I hope it gets picked up, and I hope they ask me to come back and do it. Yeah. It, was that, it was that much fun. That would be great. Yeah. So you've worked on a number of really amazing films and TV shows throughout your career. Thank you. How'd you get started in um, makeup design? In makeup? Yeah. Well, um, very early on, I loved the old monster movies, and um, I loved the old universal horror films. You know, the ones with Frankenstein, Boris Karloff, and, and The Mummy, and all those. And I was actually terrified. And uh, I remember going to my mom and saying, where, did, where do you get these, these, are these people from an island of mm. freaks? And, and my mother's like, no, that's, uh, there's a guy, a makeup guy that has a box, and he can. So that kind of set me in the direction of trying to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then and did so you find, did you meet somebody that? I did. did. I met, I wrote a fan letter to this great makeup, who's the, one of the greatest makeup artists of all time. His name is Dick Smith. Mm -hmm. So I wrote him a fan letter. How old were you? I was about 15. Wow, that's young. And I didn't have his address, so I wrote, t he did the makeup in The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have his address, but I wrote to the Linda Blair fan club in Hollywood. And I drew a little picture of Dick on the envelope and put his name, The Exorcist. And that one letter went to Hollywood and made it to Dick Smith's house in Larchmont, New York, where he works in his basement workshop. Larchmont, New York. I live in Pelham, New there York. There you go. That's right next. That's mm -hmm. so funny. Yeah. All the great people. All Westchester. the great people from Westchester County. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. Look at this, guys. <laughs> so um, so I guess, do you think it was your drawing? Like, what do you think did it for him? Because most fan letters just go into a pile and nobody ever yeah, them. So I, what do you think it was? It was like, you know, it was kind of like putting a note in a bottle and throwing it in the ocean to me. Yeah. I mean, it was like that one letter got to him. And uh, I don't, I really can't tell you. I don't, I don't know if it's divine intervention. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's looking back at it, it's, it's really miraculous. But that started a correspondence with him, and, and uh, he took me under his wing as a protege. Mm -hmm. And so that led to me getting into NBC when I was 18. NBC, and then you went on, so you started at SNL, is that true? Yeah, well, I started, uh, yeah, I started on an SNL. I didn't start in the first season, that was 75, mm -hmm. but I would take the bus because I lived upstate New York, and I would go and observe the first season just to kind of, because I knew before graduating from my senior year in high school that I had the job. So I would go down to NBC, and I would just kind of study the show and observe so the show. you knew as a senior in high school that you were going to be working for Saturday Night Live. Well, I, yeah. I guess it wasn't, it wasn't like, known and, and you know. Yeah, it was in its infancy, Saturday. really, right. that yeah, okay. show. No, no one had really known much about it. But still, it's a job show. at NBC. And yeah, it was pretty, That's awesome. pretty heady stuff. That's yeah. awesome. So then you did, uh, at your t during your time at SNL, you did the Coneheads. Yeah. What else did um, I put the soul patches on the Blues Brothers when they wow. would appear when they would open up and you know with Steve Martin and uh, did a lot of makeup on mainly the boys on Billy Murray and Dan Aykroyd and, and some stuff on Belushi and and uh, and just about everything for 
I think f I did that for s about five and a half, six years. Mm. I saw Bill Murray at the airport the other day. Did you? Yeah. I was at JFK. Is we were flying to Argentina, and, and he was like just he was at security. He's great. Yeah. He's a great guy. Oh, I'm sure he is. But my brother did you went go up to him. him and my talk? brother went up to him. Yeah. He's, my brother is uh, 14, and he went up to him, and he was like, "Bill Murray, Bill Murray," and Bill Murray was like, "Please." Please leave me alone. <laughs> Did he really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. but it's okay. You I, caught him on a bad day. Sure he was traveling. Yeah. Oh. Um, but yeah, that's that's awesome. That's really oh. really cool. Is there some good Bill Murray stories that people have bumped into him and he's like bought them drinks and really showed up at their wedding receptions? Not and the Salama family. That's oh. just not how it works. Oh. Oh. That's unfortunate, but still. It's, it's very cool that you, got, that you got to work with him and all those yeah. really, really well-known comedians. And then know. recently on Aloha, I did this film in Hawaii with Emma Stone and, and Billy Murray was in the movie. Oh, and so cool. we got to kind of reunite and, and talk about the old days. It was really great to be with him again. It was really, really great. That is great. And then so after SNL, um, what, what would you say is your next big, your next big project? What was it? Um, after that, I was they, NBC was great because mm -hmm. they would let me go away and do film projects if there was no SNL. If they were down for three or four months, mm -hmm. I could go off and do a picture. So I did. I, I helped design the movie called Quest for Fire. Cool. And what was uh, that about? It was all about the Neanderthals. Um, that must was, have been fun. Uh, yeah, primal. You know th that whole thing. And then I went off and I did a film with Woody Allen called Zelig, where he's all these different characters. He transforms into different characters. And I, then I did a few more things while on staff. And then NBC's like, listen, you're getting a lot of film work. I think it's mm. time you, you flew the coop. And uh, so I n was very nervous because I had a steady job. And I went out and I started freelancing. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward many years later, yeah. you're an Academy Award winner. How about that? With that's Dick like, Tracy. That's a miracle. Yeah. Well, I don't think so because oh. you're extremely good at makeup. So well, I'm pretty sure that you deserved oh. it. <laughs> Uh, so really I would say half good. miracle, half very much you deserved what well. you got. But um, I, I've heard a story that you actually had a problem with, not a problem, but just like a little bit of an issue with the makeup and the color design of the lighting with the cinematographer on Dick Tracy yeah. that you guys yeah. had to work out. Can yeah. you please tell us about that? Yeah, well, you know, I, I was hired on Dick Tracy. I was from New York. Mm -hmm. And this is going back to 1988, where a lot of makeup guys were not being brought to Hollywood to design pictures. So that was a big thing. That was like a, a really tricky thing for Warren Beatty to, 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 to work out. So I went out there, and Vittorio Storaro was a cinematographer, and he mm -hmm. shot Apocalypse Now. I mean, he's a, a, he's a giant. You know, he's, and here's this, so anyway, make a long story short, he had this whole design ethic of how he was going to light Dick Tracy, and he was going to use color gels like reds on the makeups and greens and and what happens with those kinds of things is they, they blank out all color mm -hmm. on a prosthetic makeup. We actually put reds and broken capillaries and dots and stuff to make the camera believe in light. I'm nodding like I understand that, what you're saying. Oh, but are you? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're really convincing. No, look, I mean. He's really good. It's, it's good, but I, like, yeah. I, get, I get what you're saying, though, about yeah. the whole lighting. He had like a lighting scheme that he planned. Yes, and then I come into it, this guy from New York, this young guy from New York, yeah. who's just this is a big break. And I have to basically, in a very polite way, say to Vittorio Storaro, it doesn't work. You can't shoot Why didn't the movie work? that way. Um, well, because we put rubber pieces on the actor, mm -hmm. and you paint these blank rubber pieces to look like flesh. You put little dots, and I you see. put you know red colors in there, and veins, and broken cap, and things like that. And then if you put a red color over a red light on it, it, doesn't it just blanks out everything you've okay. done and it returns it back to just its three-dimensional form. Okay. So you lose the entire um, illusion mm -hmm. of skin tone and we just couldn't do it. Couldn't. It, just, it just didn't work. So we, we worked out a way where Vittorio could light red and blue behind people but sandwiched in between was natural light mm -hmm. and people would walk through the light temporarily. And it worked. And we, that sounds like two great. It was tricky. It was tricky. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Uh, that was tricky. This young punk from New York telling me. You know, yeah. so I was like, oh boy, yeah. I'm going to get fired before I even start this thing. You know? <laughs> well, you didn't get fired. You won the Academy Award, yeah. which is great. And now had a great crew. Yeah, great crew. Great and crew I'm sure of people. Great, yeah. great people worked on it and collaborated. I met Al Pacino there. That started. Al, the are you guys friends? I, well, we're friendly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he calls me a lot to do work with him. and You have his ear. I'm honored. I have his ear. I've got his nose. <laughs> I've got his face in my lab. And uh, 
Is this true that you in you, that you have a lab where you just have faces of people, like just of like models of yeah, like well, actors that you've worked? Yeah, well, I do, and I know that might sound weird. Yeah, it does sound a little a little bit crazy, <laughs> but it, it, it is. It, they're not their real faces. I mean, these are plaster casts of people's faces mm -hmm. that I have, and that is the f foundation of being able to design a prosthetic makeup for an actor. You have to take, like if I was going to age your face, mm -hmm. I would have to take an impression of your face and make a plaster copy of it. And then on that plaster copy, I would model in clay all the features. That is so cool. Yeah, so, so that's... you could age me, like to age 80? It would be hard, because you're a handsome young Thank you. stud, Guys. isn't he? He really is. Please. Yeah. It would be a tall order. Uh -huh. may not be possible. It is impossible for me to age this. Kiss up true. to the MC of the show. That's right. one of the first things you do. Yeah. Well... Kind of. I should be the one <laughs> kissing up to the Oscar winner uh, yeah, on the show here. Um, but okay, so back to this. Like I, I like to call it your house of faces. Yeah. Do you ever go in and just like, like look around and be like, wow, this is all the stuff. That all I the time. Yeah. I do. Do you eat in there? I do. I bow before them. There's a whole <laughs> candle ritual that I do. Right. I'm sure. No, <laughs> you're gonna cut that out. Right? No, no. Yeah. We're, don't worry. <laughs> no. Um. Okay, and one of the most iconic characters that you have done was in 2008, you worked on The Dark Knight. Yeah. Uh, you did the Joker design. You also were nominated for an Academy Award for that. Yeah. What was that experience like? That was just amazing. I mean, it really was. I mean, it was uh, very lucky. I don't even know how I got that job, really. Um, I was finishing up a film with Russell Crowe called 310 to Yuma, and I got a call in the airport. I was ready to fly back to New York, and it was Chris Nolan's people, producer, can you come to L.A. and meet for this movie? And um, it was so top secret that I had to actually read the script in Chris Nolan's office. They wouldn't let me yeah, actually exactly. take the script. So uh, I met them, and I met Heath real quick. And I didn't think the interview went really well. Uh, just had, and, it was, and they called me like an hour later and said, OK, you know, start to working on designs. And so I did a bunch of sketches. And then yeah. you know, we started working out the makeup. That's awesome. Uh, I'm curious. Go back to the interview. What is an interview for a makeup artist like? It, they're always like kind of weird. What do they weird. ask you? Yeah, it's hard. Do you to have to bring in work. They're always different. You know, they're really they're odd to me. Um, sometimes they ask for work. Most times, lately, they haven't. But um, well, you've established yourself at this point, and I'm sure you have. You were already you've already established in 2008. Mm -hmm. But meaning, like, for those who are trying to get into the business, even if there's a job interview. For a makeup artist, yeah, does that? I don't. I have no idea. Like, I just have no idea how that would work. Yeah, they're all different. You know, yeah. they're, they're some people just kind of know that you're you're kind of the right person for the job. Um, but uh, I had done a film with Chris before Chris Nolan. It was called Insomnia, and I did just mm -hmm. Al Pacino in that film, and that's where I first met Chris. And I I just don't know how it really came about. Maybe he saw Dick Tracy and. Yeah. I'd worked with a star before with Al Pacino, and that went well. And so he, they called me to do The Dark Knight. It's awesome. And, uh, you know, we uh, did some sketches. And the funny thing about that was that um, I went to London and I did tests. And as a makeup artist, you want it to look perfect. You know, you're trying it for every detail. And the makeup had to be uh, degraded mm -hmm. to look perfect, which goes against everything that you train to be a makeup artist to to do you know you why want did it have to be degraded well because the character I mean for all we know the Joker is a guy that sleeps and he, I mean he never changes his costume right he's always got matted filthy hair and he may wear his makeup for a week at a time or more so mm -hmm. you know there's parts layers to the character that have to be taken into consideration okay and he's a psychopath and a, right. an anarchist and <laughs> that adds to it. and then there's other things too. so how did you deal with something like that and how was Heath in the process Heath was incredible because it was it was like a dance in applying his makeup you know I would I literally have to have Keith Heath, Heath make certain faces to get these certain cracks and crevices in the makeup so I would actually scrunch Heath's face or he would you know, exaggerate, and we would paint these colors over it to get all these cracks and wow. and things. And then I would use aqua color black around his eyes and squirt it with Evian spray, water spray, mm -hmm. and he would wiggle and shake his face, and it would get all these drippy cracks and things. So wow. it was really, it was a close collaboration in the chair. And with it the actor. must have taken a long time the first time you did it. 
Yeah, the first time we did it, it was like over an hour or so. And, uh, but we did that makeup so many times. I got it down to like 20 minutes. Wow. Yeah, so, so it's like the repetition of doing it. You just, every, the actor knows what you're doing, knows what to do, and, and uh, hopefully I know what I'm doing mm -hmm. by that time. Yeah, that's great. And yeah. then, um, so what other, what has been, I guess, you've worked on so many awesome characters in, over the course of your career. Would, could you pick a favorite or one that you're proudest of? Wow, that's that's a hard one, you know, because even the more subtle ones, like I did Emma Stone and Rachel McAdams in Aloha, and I loved mm. doing beauty makeup. Yeah. And so there's some nice makeups in there that I did. On Mona Lisa Smile, there was all 50s beauty period makeups in mm. there, which are fun to look back at. Mm. You know, or maybe... But, but maybe I think the Joker probably is the right. most iconic iconic and most widely known and it was a blast you know it was mm -hmm. you know to try to take a clown makeup and make it look different almost in every scene is kind of tricky to do but yeah. you know so I, I I guess I would say the Joker overall mm -hmm. you know, was I mean that makes sense where the actor and the character and the makeup kind of just kind together. of all is like a hand in a glove type thing yeah that's awesome and yeah. then um, what about one that maybe a lot of people might not know but one that you were especially proud of yeah They're pr uh, well, those are what I would call the invisibles. Mm -hmm. They're the makeups that are there that don't even really, if you've seen the movie Donnie Brasco, I mean, it's a little thing, but Johnny Depp at that time really couldn't grow facial hair and it takes place uh -huh. in 1970s. So I had to glue these big sideburns on Johnny Depp every day. And uh, you know, there's like little things like that that, mm -hmm. are, that are subtle and fun to do. Yeah, and then yeah. uh, I did a film with Pacino. He plays Jack Kevorkian mm -hmm. and uh, he had to uh, kind of resemble, J uh, you know, Jack of Orkin. So I made a silicone nose and I made ears. And you could kind of tell that something was off with Al, but it w wasn't a complete transformation where, where he looked totally like somebody else. So mm -hmm. those are the invisible makeups that are kind of fun. Well, if you speak of transformations that are not invisible, right. you actually did a makeup design for Princeton. Yeah. For your... So for yeah, your daughter. Yes, I did, and I chose this makeup because it's April 1st. I don't know if the, when this will air, but it's April 1st. And, uh, April it's Fool's Day. It's April Fool's <laughs> Day. I didn't get you yet. Uh -huh. We're going to have to figure yeah, something gonna out figure for him. Out. We're going to have to figure something out. But today is the birthday of a very famous silent screen star, mm -hmm. and his name was Lon Chaney, and he was the man of a thousand faces. And he was famous for The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera, and so we dedicated... But we did a little nod in the makeup that we did mm. for you t at Princeton. Yeah. And it's a Could we see hunchback it? makeup. So, Look at that. Yeah. There it is. There's so Lauren, yeah, in all her. Yeah. Yeah. All the beauty. Could we see how, could you kind of just very briefly go through how this was put together? Like what? Yeah. Well, the first step in doing something like this is I had to take a cast. First, I had to convince Lauren to do it. Mm -hmm. which wow. she's a wonderful daughter and I'm very blessed to have her and so the that was that and then the first thing is I take a mold of Lauren's face like we talked about right taking an impression and making a plaster duplicate of her face and then on that plaster cast I sculpt in clay the prosthetic and the prosthetic is really her forehead kind of like the forehead and the eye yeah and then the here. eye and it blends over her the center of her nose and comes around the corner of her mm -hmm. mouth and stuff so it's it's a whole brow piece and the whole thing. Right. So I sculpt that in clay, and all the detail, all the work of the prosthetic is done in that stage of sculpture. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once the sculpture is completed and I like it, through a series of mold making techniques, I make a f what we call a foam latex mold. And I take a mold of the sculpture and I clean out all the clay, and then I whip up this latex compound, it, and then I uh, whip it up and froth it up, and then I pump it into the mold where the clay once was. It's extremely and elaborate. It's, 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 it, t it took about a week to put this together. Wow. And, and then um, three hours just to put it on her. And three hours I was in the room. I mean, That's right. And it took a long time. Three hours to apply. And then you bake the foam in the oven and you pull it out and you have a custom made foam latex thing. prosthetic that fits Lauren's face. Wow. Have you done makeup on your kids before? Yes, many times. Many times? Yes, they Halloween must have been pretty Halloween awesome. was always a blast. It yeah. was really... <laughs> You know, maybe not for them, but uh, it, we, we would just, my wife and I, we would have a ball making them up and mm -hmm. just, you know, just having a great time with it. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. That's nice. That that's that's fun, and it's so great that you're involving your daughter in this. Like, it's great that she came with you. We're so happy. To yeah, isn't it? She's so great, yeah. Lauren. I love her. It's lovely, wonderful. All right. So, thank you so much for being here. This Jordan, was a lot it's a of pleasure. fun. It's an honor. Really, really nice. Thank to you have for you. having me here with you at Princeton. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really and fantastic. So it's no doubt that you have an amazing career. Uh, it seems like it's only getting better and better. We can't wait oh. to see what you do next. I mean, what, do you have any plans? I don't know. We'll you see know. what's around the corner. All right, we'll know. see. I can't wait. I'm very excited. I haven't myself. planned any of this, so we'll see what the rest looks All right. like. All right. Yeah. Well, stick around for more of Princeton tonight, everybody. John Caglione, Jr., once again.